Well, good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to you all to our service of divine worship this morning. Um, a special welcome to those who are watching our streamed service during the day, and uh, especially to those uh, from the John Knox Presbyterian Church at Munding Borough in Townsville. I was pleased to be able to join with the congregation there and worship last Sunday, and we certainly hope that they will uh, get a lot out of our service today and we wish them all the best. Well, we turn to the order of service and we'll commence our worship in singing the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. We come before God now in our prayer of adoration. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has made known your mercies to our fathers in every age and has continued them to us, their children, we know that you have promised to us your presence. We pray that this will continue to be to us and to our kindred beyond the seas who are this day near to us in spirit. Help us to wait upon you in humble faith and adoration and grant that our prayers and theirs may find acceptance with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we turn now to uh, hear from God's word and our Old Testament uh, reading comes from Isaiah chapter 59 and I ask you to follow this. Uh, in the insert uh, in your order of service. Commencing to read at verse 15. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him 
that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay, both to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, and to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you, my words that I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth, or out of the mouth of your offspring, or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time and for evermore. And may God bless to our understanding that first reading from his holy word. To his name be the praise and the glory. We uh, come now to sing to God's praise, one of the grand old Alexander's hymns, which we many of us were brought up on, one day when heaven was filled with his praises. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. We come before God now in our prayers of confession and of supplication. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly confess our many sins and shortcomings. We acknowledge our transgressions as a nation and as people, our pride and vain glory, our self sufficiency and forgetfulness of you. We have been unthankfulness uh, for your great goodness to us. And we have been slow to obey uh, your command to make disciples of all nations. We've broken the unity of your church, and by our divisions, we have weakened your cause and hindered the gospel of Christ. Blot out our transgressions, O Lord, we pray, and revive your work in the midst of the years. Cause your power and glory to be seen in the sanctuary, as in the days of old, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord God, who has given us a noble inheritance, enable us to hold fast the faith which you gave to our fathers and have preserved throughout centuries of suffering and trial. Keep us true to the vision of life which you have revealed in your dear Son. Lead us in the paths of uprightness and truth. And grant that as we are always guided by your spirit and trusting in your love, we may abide in fellowship one with another and all in fellowship with you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray further in the words our Lord himself taught us to pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing again to the praise of God in the hymn, The Power of the Cross.
we turn again to read and hear from God's word, and I invite you to uh, read the uh, responsive sections of the passages printed in italics. From John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The epistle reading are selections from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, seek to show hospitality. Well, may God bless to our understanding all of those further readings from his holy word. In his name be the praise and the glory. Let us see the, um, the portion of, of scripture that we're looking at. Let's read it together. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The, the term kingdom of God is used among Christians as it is in 
is used often among Christians as, of course, it is in the Bible. We read about the kingdom of God. But what do we mean by this term, the kingdom of God? <coughs> it's very hard <coughs> to get an exact parallel in human terms. But let's use the naturalization, naturalization ceremony when you become an Australian citizen as an example. When my parents came out from Germany, and I was only seven, and within 12 months, I think, we gathered in front of the city hall and there my parents took their vows and they became Australian citizens. What did that ceremony mean? When you became an Australian citizen, as I know some of you have become Australian citizens, what does it mean? It means this, from now on, you are no longer citizens of another country. You now are citizens of your new country, Australia, and you have your allegiance and loyalty to the Queen and to her subject and those elected into office by the people of Australia. Now that you are citizens of Australia, where your loyalty lies, and that's where your obedience also lies. You are loyal and obedient to the Constitution of Australia. Similarly, those who belong to the Kingdom of God, as we heard in our children's address, have foregone the allegiance of another foreign country. In this case, an alien enemy kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. And through all that Jesus has done, <clears throat> we have become citizens <clears throat> of the kingdom of God. Our loyalty, our love, our obedience no longer lies within the kingdom of darkness and Captain Satan. Our loyalty, our love, and obedience now belongs to God as we have been transferred into his kingdom. The first point I want to talk about in, is that the kingdom of God is a reality. When we come to the first letter to the Corinthians, we read in chapter 4, verse 20, uh, sorry, we read in chapter 4, verse 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. And then in verse 9, in our passage, which we just read, or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, of course, there's a future, to future aspect of the kingdom of God. We are on a journey, and our journey will take us to eternity, to our eternal home in heaven. And there the kingdom of God will be complete, will be perfect. But even so, the reality of the kingdom of God is right now. The, to begin with, it is a kingdom set up by God and ruled by God. Despite the fact that Satan is called a prince of this world, that he is still allowed a certain amount of power and influence and that he is the power, as we heard before, behind the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of God is a reality here and now today. It is a kingdom where the righteousness of God, where the love of God, where the um, compassion of of God, where the salvation of God, where the love of God rules, and where the light of God penetrates, <clears throat> penetrates through the darkness of sin and evil and transfers us into the kingdom of light. The Bible makes it quite clear 
that these two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, are in sharp opposition to one another. Secondly, the king, not only is the kingdom of God a reality today, the kingdom of God, members of the kingdom of God, are not born into this kingdom naturally. And that's why in the children's address, I made the point that all of us, and perhaps some still here this morning, are members of the kingdom of darkness. When you are born, you're not born into the kingdom of God. You're not born into the kingdom of light. You are, in fact, born into the kingdom of darkness. And that is because Adam and Eve sinned and all who have followed them have sinned with them and we are born sinners. We are born into the kingdom of darkness, not into the kingdom of light. And so the Spirit of God, God hasn't left us on our own. God hasn't thrown us away and dumped us. No, God, by his spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, begins to work in the lives of God's people so that the new king, King Jesus, King Jesus will begin to reign and rule in our hearts. It's what we would call a supernatural birth. It is the power of God at work in our lives, doing that which you and I cannot do. We can't turn to God by ourselves. We can't turn by ourselves from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It is only by God's power, it is only by God's Holy Spirit that we are able to repent of our sins, to see our need for forgiveness, to see our need of a saviour. And it is only then that we are transferred to the kingdom of light. As the Bible said, but as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to become members of God's kingdom, God's team, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood. Remember I said you can't be born into the kingdom of God, who were not born of blood, nor the will of flesh. I said, you and I can't suddenly decide that we're going to be members of the kingdom of light. No. How do we become members of the kingdom of, of light, of God? Only by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus adds that well, those well-known words in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We must be born again. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we will recognize our sin and that we will repent of our sin and that we will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, become a member of God's kingdom, the kingdom of light, and love and follow and serve and obey him. What this born again means is clearly spelled out in Mark 1.15. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. To be born again means that we've not only admitted our sinfulness, but we've confessed that we are sinners and that we've repented of our sin and that we've turned right around. A 360 degree turn and we have embraced Jesus as our loving Lord and Saviour. So the kingdom of God is a reality. You're not born into the kingdom of God. It is a supernatural birth, the power of the Holy Spirit that brings, enables you to repent and become a member of God's kingdom. Thirdly, the kingdom of God is not a physical place but it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Where Christ is, there is the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus says in Luke 17, 21, nor will they say, here it is, that is the kingdom of God, or there is the kingdom of God. No. For the kingdom of God is within you. 
When you are a Christian, you are a member of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you because you have a living and saving and eternal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is always concerned with people, to make people righteous, to set them apart for the kingdom of God. To extend the kingdom is not to use force. To extend God's kingdom is not through political means. To extend God's kingdom and to bring the kingdom of God into the lives of people will only happen through the proclamation, through the sharing, through evangelism, through sharing the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever Christ is at work, there is the reality of the kingdom of God. Jesus himself said, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke eleven twenty. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is not how I speak. It is not how others speak. It is the power, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The Jews made the mistake of wanting the reality of the kingdom of God in power in a physical realm. They wanted Jesus to be king, an earthly king. And they wanted Jesus to establish the kingdom of God by chucking out the Romans so that they could again be the boss in their own land. But the kingdom of God is not a physical reality. It's a spiritual reality in the lives of people. They rejected the truth that the kingdom of God must be within them that they must repent, that they have to change their allegiance from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of evil to the kingdom of righteousness and the kingdom of God. They sought salvation by the law. They thought that if they did this and that and everything else, that would make them a Christian. But the Bible clearly says, you cannot become a Christian by what you do or by what you say or by who you are. It is only when the Holy Spirit takes hold of you and you come to realise that you are a sinner and that in God's strength you are able to repent and turn away from evil that you become a member of God's kingdom, kingdom of light. And that is through the gospel, the power of God, unto salvation to all who believe. And then fourthly, while the kingdom of God has certainly come upon all who love and serve Christ, and therefore as we love Jesus more, as we learn more about Jesus and God um, daily, we, the kingdom of God grows within us. We know also, do we not, that the old kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, will do everything to invade our lives. Satan does not like to see Christians at peace with God. He wants to do everything to disturb that. He will tempt us to do wrong. He will tempt us to steal, to commit adultery, have sex before marriage, whatever. That is still a reality also. But in God's strength, we are able to, to overcome. As we said to the children before, we must show the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We must show that we are living members of the kingdom of God. There will be struggles. There will be temptations to overcome. There will be sins that we will need to bring God for forgiveness. There will be persecutions and trouble because we follow Jesus. For well, Paul reminds us that through many tribulations, we must enter into the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. But then, but there will come a time when all of these will pass away and all will be gloriously perfect once again when we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
and in glory. There we will worship, love, and serve God perfectly, something which we have not been able to do until we reach heaven. Yes, there will come about that final defeat of the evil one. The power of the kingdom of darkness will be destroyed forever because Satan and all who followed him will be thrown down into hell, into the lake of eternal fire. All this stresses once more that the kingdom of God is not a physical place but a relationship between you and Jesus Christ. It has begun here. It is the reality here where Jesus is, there is the kingdom of God. But it will become perfect when we reach heaven. Wherever Christ is king and Lord, there's the kingdom of God. And I'm going to challenge each one of you here, young and old, children and parents, I hope you're listening. I need to challenge you. Which are you, which kingdom are you a member of? Has the kingdom of God come upon you? Is Jesus Christ the King and the Lord and the Saviour of your life? Do you rejoice in his wonderful salvation, in his peace, in the promise that he will care for you? Are you able to call upon his strength? And do you have the assurance right now, the assurance right now of sins forgiven and that you will have eternal life when you die? For those who are part of God's kingdom now, you have a glorious eternity, a wonderful eternity to look forward to. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no longer any death. There shall be no longer any mourning or crying. These things have passed away. All will be perfect. We will be able to serve and love and worship God perfectly. So firstly, the kingdom of God is a reality now and it will find its completion in glory. Secondly, the kingdom of God and its recognition. Why did the apostle, in the middle of this chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, suddenly break out in this mini-sermon of those verse, of three verses which we read before? Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul had been dealing with the problems and needs in the church of Corinth, and now emphasizes another need, the need for clear understanding what it means to be a member of the kingdom of God. The need for a clear conviction of what happens or what happened when they became a Christian. They needed to recognize the kingdom of God and then to live out what it means to be that member. Once the Corinthian Christians were as condemned sinners, like us, they first belonged to the kingdom of darkness. But now, by the grace of God, they have been brought into God's kingdom. Paul is emphasizing that those who show no change in their lives those who claim to be Christians and they just swear like the rest, they do as the world does, they spend and waste their money and time, when there's no change in their lives, Paul is saying that they are not a member, they're not a member of the kingdom of God. They may say that they're Christian, they may say that they're a member of, the, of God's team, but they're not. Paul says no. Those who continue <coughs> in the way... <coughs> In the way <clears throat> in the ways of the kingdom of evil <clears throat> have not recognized the kingdom of God. 
the prince who rules over them, Satan himself, has blinded them to the truth. God reminds us that Satan is the father of lies. There's no truth in him. Why we bother to follow him or to listen to him beats me. He is the prince of lies. In 1 Peter 1, 3 4, we read where Peter writes, by his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance or a kingdom which is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This inheritance is here likened to the promised land which awaited God's people as they travelled through the wilderness. They were travelling towards a promised land, Israel. We also are, 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 are moving towards the promised land, heaven, eternity. And Peter reminds us that if we belong to God's kingdom, that, that kingdom, eternal kingdom, is ours. Nothing, nothing, not the power of Satan will be able to stop us from getting into heaven. Despite all the difficulties facing the people, they were under divine obligation to get rid of every alien influence in their land and in their community life. The people of God, the Israelites, were told they were to have nothing to do with the evil in the nations round about. And the same and the same applies to us today. We are not to have anything to do with anything that belongs to the kingdom of darkness. If we have this promise, this glorious promise, why do we listen to Satan, as I said before? The unrighteous, the sinners, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you do not love Jesus, not a Christian, if you've not been made righteous, and when I say not being made righteous, that is your, if your sins have not been taken away, if you've not repented, and if you have not um, turned to Jesus, you will not enter the eternal kingdom. The unrighteous, the flagrant sinners, do not recognize Christ and his kingdom. In fact, they want nothing to do with Christ or with living in his kingdom. And so the challenge for us here this morning is this. Have we recognised the reality of the kingdom of God and the entry standards to becoming a member of that kingdom? We cannot say we are Christian and then continue to live as members of the kingdom of darkness. And that's what Paul stresses here in 1 Corinthians 6. For the immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the sexual perverts, the homosexuals, the thieves, the covetous person, the drunkard, those who rebel against authority and the cheats, unless they repent and change their ways, they cannot, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We need to realise that all of us are sinners. It's not the self-pronounced good people who inherit the kingdom of God. For the Bible reminds us that no one is good, but the sinner who has confessed his or her sin, the sinner who does a complete U-turn, leaving the kingdom of darkness and coming to Christ and becoming a member of the kingdom of light, God's kingdom, they are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God eternally. Jesus said to repent and believe the gospel. When we do that, we recognize that the kingdom of God is at hand and that we are serving and loving Christ and living out what it means to be a Christian. We have recognized what it means to follow Christ. And so what are the responsibilities? The kingdom of God and its responsibilities. Paul stresses that, firstly, they were washed. They were washed. They were 
washed clean of their sins by Christ's blood. We think that we can get rid of sin by pretending it isn't there or by trying to convince ourselves that there's no such thing as sin. I'm sure that the Corinthians tried all of those and it didn't work. Only Christ can wash away our sin. And if Christ has washed away our sin, why do we want to continue to walk in the way of sin? And then Paul goes on to say that we've been sanctified. The word sanctified means that we've been set apart from the world, we've been made holy, and we've been set apart to do the work of our Lord. So our responsibility is to show in our lives that we truly love the Lord Jesus and that by our works for which we've been set apart are obvious that those works glorify God and show that we love him and want to serve him. Paul stresses in Ephesians that we are saved for good works. Do we show in our lives those good works? Or do we leave here this morning and forget about everything that we've heard? We're Christians, or so-called, for one and a quarter hours on Sunday. doesn't work that way. We must take with us all that we've heard to love Christ and to show in our living 24-7 that we belong to him and that we are members of his kingdom. And the third word that Paul uses to describe, to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how we are recognised as Christians in the kingdom, is the word justified. And this is simply a word which means that our sins have been taken away and we are guilty no more. And, of course, Christ did that by dying on the cross. A penalty had to be paid for our sins and Christ paid for that penalty. When we commit a crime, a penalty has to be paid. Christ paid that penalty for us. We have been justified. And because we've been justified, we've been made righteous. We are now not guilty. We are without sin. We are not to look back like the Israelites did, wanting to go back to Egypt because they believed that they had everything they needed and life was much easier there. That's a lie, of course. We must look forward. Such love, how can we not give our all to him? The reality, the recognition, the responsibilities of living kingdom life. Leave your sinful way. Come follow Christ. And together with all Christians here and throughout the world, join together in living out our membership in God's kingdom in a responsible way, giving our allegiance to Christ and him alone, and rejoice, for great is your reward in him. Let us pray. O oh, Father, again we've heard the clear call, and Satan will do everything to, to kill that call, to get it out of our minds, to forget what you have spoken to us about today. Lord, we are so prone while claiming to be in God's team, in the kingdom of God. We're so prone, it is, we find it so easy to follow the kingdom of darkness, not to allow our mind to dwell upon Christ so that all that we say, do and think will be what Christ would say, would be what Christ would do and what Christ would do. Lord, show to us where our lives are still live the worldly way, where we, in your strength, and because of our love for you, and because of your love for us, we will change those things in our lives, so that Jesus will be first and foremost. People will recognise that we are members of your kingdom. People will see the change 
that comes about when we turn to the Lord Jesus, when he becomes our Lord and King. Lord, help us not to leave this place today unchanged, but to leave this changed people who love you and who will serve you moment by moment. And we pray this in Jesus' name. kingdom of God is justice and joy, but Jesus is true of sin was destroyed. You'll be waited upon for your tithes and offerings, and those who are watching online, if you um, are so led, um, the details are there in the order service that have been sent to you, in which way you are able to contribute to the work of the kingdom. But just a reminder here, folks, that um, Money is not a swear word. God uses money to grow his kingdom. And if you are not loving Christ and giving as God has given to you, then the work of his kingdom here will suffer and perhaps not be able to go on. So give as God has given to you and, uh, and you will have that opportunity as we sing this here.
and that you will lead them safely through this valley of the shadow of death. We do pray for Petra's mother, for Alice. We ask, Lord, that you would be merciful and gracious and that you will bring healing to her body and that she will be able to get the help that is needed at this time. Father, we are thankful for the, for the, um, of, for the availability of the, um, of the medical intervention that we have here in our land. For being able to go down the road to a hospital, to a doctor, to receive um, great treatment. And yet we know there are places that do not have this. And we ask that um, nations that do have will learn to share with those who do not have. Father, we pray for our church, we pray for our people. We pray, Lord, that you will go our love for you. Help us to show day by day that we are members of the kingdom of God, that we are members of your kingdom. We pray for families. Father, we pray for parents, for mothers, for fathers, that they will lead their children in the way of Jesus, that they will do all to encourage, to urge their children to follow Jesus, to put him first. We pray, Father, that they will come to know that it's only in Jesus that there is a purpose for living. We pray for children to help us be a good example to them. We pray for those who have particular needs at this time. We ask, Lord, for those with um, marriage difficulties, that your healing strength would be there, your reconciliation would be brought about through the love of Christ. For those who are facing financial or other difficulties, may they bring these to you. And we ask, Lord, that you will lead them safely through these issues. Father, we pray for those with health issues. We pray for the end. We ask, Lord, that you will be um, speedy healing for that end. We know that others in this congregation also have health issues. And we pray, Lord, that, that they will bring these to you and that you will be gracious and in accordance with your will bring healing to their bodies. So Lord, we pray that you will grow our church. We pray, Father, that those who are not here today, that their love for you will grow and be such that nothing will keep them from worshipping you Sunday by Sunday. So Lord, we pray for our nation, that our nation will again turn unto you, we pray for those in Parliament who love you, that they will stand firm upon the truth of your word. Lord, we pray again that you will heal our land. We seek forgiveness for all our sins against you and that this pandemic will be lifted. We pray, Father, for those who would divide our nation, for those who would lord their power over people and take the right of people away. We pray, Lord, that, that this will cease and uh, that this dividing Australia will not continue. Father, help us all now to go out into the world to love you and to share the gospel. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May the mind of Christ, my Saviour, live in me from day to day.
now by mercy, grace, and peace from Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you both now and forever. Amen.